This is Eddie Muller, and I welcome you to 87 Minutes of Rambling Discourse on The Big Combo, which has a reputation as Joseph H. Lewis's second best film, not quite in the same league as his 1950 classic, Gun Crazy. By the time we've reached the end of this commentary, my opinion on that subject will be clear. Now, whether you think this movie is great or awful or somewhere in between, One thing that's certain is that the film is a high-concept, low-budget distillation of tropes and iconography familiar from 10 years of Hollywood noir. Take the bird's-eye view of the urban jungle under the jazzy theme by David Raxon. By 1955, this kind of title sequence was practically de rigueur in an American crime film. As we go along, we're going to see so many scenes endemic to noir The film plays like an album of noir's greatest hits. You may have noticed when the film's title appears, it's the scriptwriter who gets creative ownership, The Big Combo by Philip Yordan, something typically reserved for authors the caliber of Hemingway, Faulkner, Fitzgerald. And it's especially ironic considering there's a good chance Phil Yordan didn't even write this script. Yordan was, however, one of the producers of this film, partners with Sidney Harmon in Security Pictures. So you know right off who's calling the shots. This film is so low budget, they couldn't even afford to give Joseph Lewis the H that usually appears in his credit line. The real star of this show, in my opinion, is its cinematographer, John Alton. We're going to see him, if not at his absolute best, at his most concentrated, resourceful, and iconic creating images worthy of Edward Hopper or Arthur Fellig, a.k.a. Ouija. The picture gets off to a fast start with this terrific chase scene, which I suspect Alton had a hand in directing. The action swings through a series of perfectly composed nocturnal tableau. Who is this beautiful woman, and why are these guys after her? Now, this is a strong opener, terrifically staged, but... When Lee Van Cleef and Earl Holloman finally catch up to Gene Wallace, something happens that will recur time and again throughout the film. A transition from artful to awkward, as Alton's gorgeous compositions suddenly give way to a static and uninteresting three-shot in what's obviously not an actual location, but a soundstage. And little is done to camouflage the difference. Clearly, Lewis and his crew were making this film on a short schedule and a threadbare budget. I'll be discussing the practical nature of this production in great detail as we go along. Despite the static framing, Alton lights the scene so Gene Wallace radiates an ethereal glow while the hoods are all shadowy menace. In fact, this is the way he's going to light Gene Wallace throughout the movie. I don't think she gets a single shadow on her face at any time. It's always nice to see Jay Adler, especially in a film noir. This was definitely an easy day's work for him. Show up, drink some coffee, saunter towards the camera. Robert Middleton was in the early days of his film career when he took this role as Captain Peterson, the boss of obsessive cop Leonard Diamond, played by the co-producer Cornell Wilde. This long expository scene in Diamond's office is nicely photographed, but it has a few jarring edits that I think point to how short the production schedule was. Mostly it's done in one long take, a Joe Lewis specialty, except for a couple of inserted close-ups and one oddly mismatched two-shot. Now this is the kind of scene in which Lewis, when he was working at Columbia, would have found interesting ways to move the camera into different angles and closer shots without resorting to any cuts. He's going to utilize this technique throughout the film, brilliantly at times, less so at other times. This film is a co-production of Security Pictures and Theodora Productions. Security was a partnership between Sidney Harmon and writer-producer Phil Yordan, while Theodora essentially was Cornell Wilde, who was just getting his feet wet as a producer. Sidney Harmon had long since established himself on Broadway. 
He was a member of the legendary Group Theater in New York. So seeing him pop up in Hollywood in the mid-50s at the helm of a cheap crime drama is a little surprising. Sort of like Harold Klurman, his Group Theater colleague, directing Cornell Woolrich's Deadline at Dawn for RKO back in 1946. Harmon was also a writer, like Jordan. In fact, he won an Oscar in 1942 for Best Screen Story for Talk of the Town, the classic directed by George Stevens. The production's lack of time and money necessitated somebody as wily as Phil Jordan to pull this show together. Now, Jordan is one of the most fascinating and mysterious characters of this Hollywood era, but a lot of suspicion swirls around his legacy. That's why I said at the top that it's debatable whether Jordan even wrote this film. It's been proven that in the 1950s, his modus operandi was to make splashy deals for screenwriting jobs and then utilize a stable of blacklisted writers to actually produce the work. Not to say Jordan couldn't write. He could. But he was much more of an operator, a guy who liked swinging deals more than he liked actually sitting down at a typewriter and doing the work. It's entirely possible this script was the work of Ben Maddow, who wrote Man Crazy, the film Jordan and Harmon did before this one, as well as Men at War, a picture they'd make after the big combo. Now, these two films have been established as being Ben Maddow's scripts, but lacking the discovery of its production files, the big combo remains a mystery. Unless, of course, Jordan actually did write it, which on the one hand seems unlikely, given that it's right in this period that he was using uncredited ghosts almost exclusively, while on the other hand, it does contain scenes of cleverness and cruelty that are hallmarks of earlier scripts we know Jordan actually did write. What Phil Jordan was exceptional at was shaping a script, especially to fit a paltry budget. This was a talent he honed working in the mid-1940s with the notorious King Brothers when they were producing movies for bargain basement monogram pictures. Jordan earned an Oscar nomination for writing their unexpected hit, Dillinger, which alternated sharply crafted set pieces with passage work cobbled together from existing stock footage. Where most writers saw words on a page, Jordan could see the dollars and cents, and that's why it was always his ambition to be a writer and a producer. And toward the end of this scene, the script, whoever wrote it, gets to the essential thrust of the story. Making Diamond's obsession with busting the gangster, Mr. Brown, into a personal battle over a woman. This hook is what gives the big combo a sort of elemental power and sets it apart from other organized crime exposés of the time. In this nightclub scene, we're back with a woman who's the focal point of the battle between the cop and the crook, Susan Lowell, played by Jean Wallace. Now, if you didn't catch on to the fact that she's the focal point, John Alton is going to remind you every time she appears on camera. She is literally a beacon of light. He photographs her in a way that makes her pale skin and blonde hair radiate. And this is further enhanced by the director's decision to always have her dressed in some shoulderless outfit, showing off as much of her alabaster skin as possible. And if you're wondering why it takes two torpedoes to keep this woman on a short leash, well, that's another subject that I'll be getting into in, in due time. It's just playing a Beethoven cycle. Oh, I, I haven't the interest I once had in the piano, Mr. Audubon. Well, now I'm disappointed. You don't play anymore. The only thing I play now, Mr. Audubon, is stud poker. Jesus, how many times is she going to call Roy Gordon Mr. Audubon? She says it like five or six times in about half a minute. Wallace does a good job in acting Susan's doped-up state. And sad to say, the actress was drawing on personal experience. She got into the movie business in the early 1940s, having been a teenage showgirl. She had brief contracts at both Fox and Paramount, but her career never really caught fire. And then she made the mistake of marrying Joan Crawford's ex-husband, Franco Tone, which turned out to be a pretty rocky seven-year bitch. Anyway, 
1946, Wallace tried to commit suicide by swallowing a bottle of sleeping pills. And when that didn't work, she gave it another go in 1949, shoving a kitchen knife into her abdomen. Fortunately, she survived both the self-inflicted stabbing as well as a second short-lived marriage to a soldier before she finally met Mr. Wright and got herself sorted out. Who was Mr. Wright, you might ask? We'll get to that. This locker room scene where we're introduced to the formidable Mr. Brown again shows Joe Lewis's penchant for shooting whole scenes in a single take. And this one comes off more elegantly than the earlier scene in Diamond's office. We're also introduced to the deaf and dethroned McClure, Brown's flunky. Casting Brian Donlevy in this role had a streak of Billy Wilder-type cruelty to it. Since 15 years earlier, Don Levy would have been cast as Mr. Brown, the kind of swaggering kingpin he often played, like in 1942's The Glass Key, where he was top billed above Alan Ladd. Here he's a punching bag for Richard Conti, who portrays one of the most memorable villains in his long career. Conti wasn't exactly at his peak either. At this time, he was making lots of low-rent crime pictures, both in America and in England, Stuff like Highway Dragnet, The Big Tip-Off, and Curse of the Red Monkey. He only got this part at the last minute because the intended star, Jack Palance, dropped out. Palance was on the rise, and he made a certain demand after he'd signed on that the producers would not accept. So, he jumped ship. He ended up making The Big Knife instead where he ended up acting his head off for Robert Aldrich, a director with no top to go over. The character of Mr. Brown would have been entirely different if Jack Palance had played it. Scarier, definitely, but probably not as sexy and as insinuating. The part's already a bit heavy-handed as written. Palance would have jackhammered it into the ground. Given that, Brown's Winner's Manifesto is classic. I like to think this is actually Phil Jordan's dialogue. In 1955, cold-hearted declarations like this were uttered by movie heavies to show how despicable they were. Today, Mr. Brown could be writing speeches for presidential candidates, or maybe running for office himself. Once the headshot of Gene Wallace is tucked away, we get another scene played in a single take probably shot immediately after the earlier one with Bob Middleton, since the camera's in pretty much the same position. And now we're let in on who Susan's mysterious stalker is. A cop, working off the books, we suspect, for the smitten Lieutenant Diamond. Not many actors could pull a tired hangdog expression, quite like Jay Adler. Where is she? General Hospital. She's dying. He's so tired, I imagine he asked for his lines to be cut to the bare minimum, just to save his breath. As soon as Diamond enters the hospital, we get a John Alton signature shot. Uh, Joe, can you please have those two nurses stand directly in front of that key light? Yes, yes, that's perfect. What do you want, Mr. Brown? Joe, tell the man I want to rot. Mr. Brown, I'd like to have Miss Lowell released. He'll put her in a private hospital. The dialogue that gets thrown back and forth here between Diamond and Brown makes absolutely no sense from a legal standpoint. In fact, for a cop, Diamond pretty much makes a fool of himself most of the time, which Brown seems to relish. But none of that really matters, because the point of this scene is that it's round one in the head-to-head -head battle between these two bull elks, fighting it out to prove who's more virile and deserving of the woman. That would be the woman who's down the hall getting her stomach pumped out because at this point she probably despises all men. Must the charge? Homicide. It's ridiculous. She wouldn't kill a fly. She'd try to kill herself. Is that a crime? It happens to be against two laws, God's and man's. I'm booking her under the second. Tell the man if he puts her on trial out. Alicia. Alicia. Susan. 
So Mr. Brown takes round one going away, not even close. After all, he's got a deaf guy acting as his mouthpiece, and he gets all the best lines. Joe, tell the man I'm going to break him so fast he won't have time to change his pants. If you think you've seen this cop versus crook setup before, it's probably because you've seen Cry of the City, Robert C. Admack's great 1948 noir that had this exact same dynamic between crook and cop. In fact, if Martin Rome, the guy Richard Conti played in that film, had lived at the end of that movie, sorry if that was a spoiler, he'd have grown up and changed his name to Mr. Brown. There are scenes Conti has in that film with Victor Mature that are almost identical to scenes in this film. Despite his supposedly being smitten with Susan Lowell, this scene would seem to indicate that Diamond's true motivation is jealousy of Brown. Because here he's got Susan in his hands and he treats her horribly, unconscionably really. He's obviously more obsessed with finding something to bring down his rival than he is with her. Please. If you'd get up and walk, you'd be a lot better off. And okay, despite what I said earlier, I confess, Alton does let a shadow cross Gene Wallace's face in this scene. But I'll bet if he had a little more time, he would have worked out a way to eliminate it. Okay. Earlier, I'd mentioned that Gene Wallace finally found her Mr. Right. And yep, you guessed it. This is the guy. It's good. Why did you try to kill yourself? Oh, I don't know why. I can't remember. Please let me go to Were sleep. Were you jealous? Is that why? Was there another woman? Please, please. There was another woman, wasn't there? Just you mentioned me her name, sleep. Alicia. Is that right? They met in 1951, while Cornell Wilde was still married to actress Patricia Knight. In 1949, she had co-starred with Wilde in a pretty good Douglas Sirk noir called Shockproof, written by Sam Fuller. I saw it. Where'd you see it? On a letter? In his apartment. It was raining outside, and there was a mist on the window. Weil had been something of a Svengali for night, wrangling her a contract at Fox and essentially forcing the studio to cast her in pictures. But the couple fell out, yes, after, after Weil took up with Wallace, who in 1951 was not that far removed from the character she's playing here. I'm sure Cornell Wilde had no trouble relating to Lieutenant Diamond's savior complex, as his relationship with Wallace, at least in the beginning, had more than a little similarity to the characters in this movie. I'm not saying he was this rough with her, but he did definitely see himself as her savior, since she had recently tried to kill herself. He essentially took it upon himself to save not only her life, but her career. Wilde married Jean Wallace in September 1951, less than a month after he'd divorced Patricia Knight. And while all this sounds like a formula for a combustible union, they stayed together for 30 years. They did eventually get divorced, however, and Wilde died less than a year after that. Sam. We're going to find out who Alicia is. I want you to pick up every hood that works for Brown. And pick up Brown himself. Now, the rousting of Brown's boys is accomplished through the use of stock footage purchased from another studio, most, most likely Warner Brothers, because I definitely recognize this shot outside police department headquarters at L.A.'s City Hall. I've seen it used in several other films, most prominently Crime Wave, made a few years before this. And I'm not even sure that Crime Wave didn't borrow this footage from an earlier film. We won't even discuss whether it's at all believable that the police department could suddenly pull 96 hoodlums in on such short order and on obviously specious grounds. We'll just chalk it up to Phil Jordan being more interested in the cop versus crook mythos than in making a genuine procedural with authentic or even believable police work. Lewis handles this bit of expository business in a single shot on a set that's just a back wall and some bars in the foreground. He lets Alton's lighting do all the rest. According to a July 9, 1954 article in Variety, 
which was mainly about the signing of Gene Wallace to co-star in the film, the big combo was originally intended to be shot in widescreen and in color. This article also noted that no director had yet been assigned the project. Now, this was two months before the start of shooting, and Jack Palance had yet to be offered the role of Mr. Brown. At this point, Jordan, Harmon, and Wilde had no distribution deal in place. They were hoping to talk United Artists into underwriting the rest of the show and handling the distribution. But by the end of July, they decided to go instead with Allied Artists, which at this point was making a big push for the, for the big time, inking deals with artists like John Huston, William Wyler, and Billy Wilder. So you can imagine where that'd leave newcomers like Security Pictures and Theodora Productions. My hunch is that Jordan and partners didn't get from Allied Artists the kind of financial support they expected, even though they were touting that they were going to sign up up-and-coming Jack Palance to top-line this picture. And that's when the red alert probably sounded. The producers, once they knew this wasn't going to be a color show, made a mayday call to John Alton, who had a reputation around town as a guy who knew how to do more with less. I wouldn't even be surprised if Alton was promised more dough than whoever would eventually be signed to direct this picture. Because this, this was fairly standard with Alton. He preferred working on low-budget films and was often the highest-paid member of the crew. Producers loved his efficiency. He could get tremendous visual impact in such a short amount of time, and producers and directors were happy to pay him well and grant him virtual control of the production. Jack Palance officially signed on to play Mr. Brown on August 10, 1954, and Brian Donlevy inked a deal to play McClure two days later. The film was set to start shooting later that month, but they still didn't have a director. Now, problems immediately started when Palance suggested that his wife, Broadway actress Virginia Baker, be tested for what the trade papers called the second female lead. Now, I honestly can't tell you whether that would have been the role of Rita, Diamond's dancer girlfriend, or the mysterious Alicia, as they both have about the same amount of screen time. Here in Diamond's office, Cornell Wilde and Bob Middleton perform another entire scene in a single take, which more often than not will be Lewis's modus operandi. Now, part of the reason may be because he came on board so late. Amazingly, it wasn't made official that Lewis was directing the picture until Tuesday, August 24th, and production was set to start Thursday the 26th. Now, they were four days into shooting when Jack Palance suddenly quit, furious that the producers refused to consider his wife for one of the two female roles in the picture. Fortunately, Joe Lewis and Richard Conti belonged to the same tennis club, and before Palance was even done throwing his tantrum, Lewis made a phone call, and Conti agreed to step in and bail out the project. After all, this was a role he had played several times before, so he needed zero prep time. And I can't let this scene go by without commenting on this goofy bit of script writing. Take a look at that graph. The crucial lead to a hood that's been in hiding for seven years comes courtesy of Mr. Brown himself, who for some absurd reason has blurted out the name Bettini in response to the word spaghetti during the polygraph test. And wouldn't you know it, Diamond announces that Bettini is, quote, the only hood we failed to pick up like there are precisely 97 hoods at large in the city, and all of them work for Mr. Brown. Hmm. The filmmakers do a great job of faking Diamond's driving in this scene, because they don't go for the routine front-on shot with bad rear projection. And doing it this way with the camera in the back, they just have some light passing outside. Interestingly, except for the footage under the title sequence, the first time we get a genuine city exterior is this pickup shot of Cornell Wilde on a street in downtown Los Angeles. And when they cut to him entering the alley beside the burlesque house, they don't even try to hide the fact that this is an indoor studio set. 
In fact, the big combo was made almost entirely inside Kling Studios at La Brea and Sunset, which up until 1953 had been Charlie Chaplin's base of operations in Hollywood. But he was blacklisted and run out of the country. It was sold to a Chicago TV company that leased it out to independent productions. Red Skelton took it over in 1958, and eventually it became the home of the Muppets, a.k.a. Jim Henson Productions. Now, this is actress Helene Stanton playing Diamond's on-again, off-again girlfriend, who in classic noir fashion is a burlesque dancer. I mean, really, what else could she be if you're writing a script that's an accumulation of all the noir tropes of the past 10 years? I'm going to assume Rita is the character that brought Jack Palance into conflict with the producers. He wanted his wife for this part, probably because Wilde had cast his wife in the other main role. But Joe Lewis held out for Helene Stanton, who was already 30 years old and hadn't accumulated much of a movie career. But you can clearly see why he cast her. She's got a very striking look. Can't say anything nice without spoiling it. Why do you waste your time with a cop? Could get me a nice rich hoodlum. Rita gets one of the few memorable lines in this movie not uttered by Mr. Brown when she says, Hoodlums, detectives. Woman doesn't care how a man makes his living, only how he makes love. Given Diamond's obsessive jealousy of Mr. Brown, I'm surprised he didn't smack Rita in the mouth for saying such a thing. It would have been in character, given how rottenly he treats women who don't instantly snap to his righteous crusade. Put them on for me. Note that this is one more in a growing list of single-shot scenes, although Lewis incorporates another of his preferred techniques, tracking out and tracking in within the same shot, to ease the stasis and add some emphasis. And here we are in Susan's apartment, bringing us to one of the most notorious bits of business in the film, and one which, at least by his account, is entirely the brainchild of Joseph Lewis. Before I get into that, however, I do want to point out how differently this scene would have played with Jack Palance in the role of Mr. Brown. Now, there's a palpable tension in the give and take between Conti and Wallace that hints at something complex, perhaps even perverse in their relationship. I don't think it would have been there with Palance, who'd have been too creepy and intimidating. Anyway, the scene apparently grew out of Lewis asking Jean Wallace to explain her character's motivation. Namely, why would she stick with a guy like Brown? What was she getting out of it? And Wallace didn't really come up with a good answer, so Lewis suggested She was doing it for the precise reason Rita mentioned in the previous scene. The guy did things to her sexually that left her helplessly in his thrall. Now, the way Lewis related this to Peter Bogdanovich is that he made sure Cornell Wilde was someplace else when it came time to shoot this scene. Remember, Wilde was the producer, so he had a tendency to be on set even when he wasn't in a scene. And when it came to the end of this scene, which need I say, is done as a single shot, Lewis told Conti to lower himself to the floor behind Wallace and for her to, I don't know, act like Hedy Lamar in ecstasy. And Lewis, whose tales always have to be taken with a grain of salt, said he even voiced some off-camera oohs and ahs, which could be heard on the soundtrack, which is not true, of course. Well, he may have done it, But they would have been cut, because according to Lewis, Wilde was furious at the way this scene was staged. He felt it was embarrassing to his wife, degrading, blah, blah, blah. I honestly don't know if any of this is true. If Wilde was so outraged, he could have just faded the scene out sooner. He had more power on this production than Joe Lewis, remember. Lewis also maintained that the scene ran afoul of the censors, who declared it filthy and unnatural. And Lewis, in turn, accused them of being filthy and unnatural because nothing at all is shown. Whatever they imagined, he told them, was in their own filthy and unnatural minds. Anyway, whatever the truth is, the scene would 
go down in movie history as perhaps the first suggestion of Cunnilingus ever made on screen. So, hey, let's hear it for Joe Lewis, Richard Conti, and Gene Wallace. Now we're back at the burlesque house, and I swear to you, if they had a slightly bigger soundstage, Lewis would have blocked this entire scene as a single shot but the camera would have to get around the wall, dividing backstage from the dressing room. And that's clearly what he wants to do, but they just didn't have the space or time to make it happen. Haven't we seen the surly cop visiting the distracted stripper more than a few times in crime movies? My favorite is probably Charles McGraw and Adele Jurgens in Armored Car Robbery. In fact, it looks like they may even have used the same set decoration in both films. I am, quite frankly, surprised that Helene Stanton did not have more of a movie career. She was also a singer and dancer and did shows in Vegas around this time. But her only other pictures are mostly junk, like Jungle Moon Men and The Phantom from 10,000 Leagues. She only made one picture before this. She was discovered by the great Hugo Haas, who put her in his picture, One Girl's Confession. She was the second female lead in that, of course, because... Only blondes got to star in Hugo Haas films. In 1957, Stanton, whose real name was Eleanor Stansbury, would marry Dr. Morton Pinsky and quit show business altogether. This is a nicely staged scene in the alley. Single shot with great camera movement with Alton really laying on the fog to hide how threadbare the set is. This take is one of the niftiest things Lewis and Alton have done together so far in the film. Okay, the kidnapping of Lieutenant Diamond brings us to the next infamous scene in this movie, one that is central to its success. And I don't mean artistically, I mean financially. This prolonged torture scene, it is the longest scene in the movie up to this point, is practically the raison d'etre of this film. I say that because every review at the time of the film's release, from the Hollywood trade papers to the most far-flung critic out in the sticks, singled out this scene as the bellwether for whether or not a viewer would actually enjoy this movie. Critics who hated the film cited this sequence as unnecessarily gruesome, repulsive, sadistic, reprehensible, you get the idea. Critics more sympathetic to hard-boiled crime dramas tended to say things like, it's red meat for the action crowd. Thanks, Fanny. But before we get into the guts of this scene, I have to point out The first few times I saw this movie, I'd assumed Lee Van Cleef's character was named Fanny. Since that's how both Earl Holloman and Brian Donlevy always pronounce it. It's only when Conti speaks the guy's name does he clearly say Fanty. I'm talking to you. Answer me. Why'd you pick me up? There he is, Mr. Brown. I was soft. Anyway, by now you've noticed that this is the first scene in a while not staged as a single shot. Lewis and Alton take their time with this sequence and use all sorts of camera setups, lighting effects, and famously sound effects. The result was strong stuff and way ahead of its time in terms of on screen meanness and casual cruelty. Without much modification, this scene would fit right into Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction or some other Quentin Tarantino film. We're going to give the lieutenant a little concert. How's that? Too loud, turn it down. Can you hear me, lieutenant? Watching the big combo again reminded me of an interview I once read with director Anthony Mann talking about how he honed his technique in the B-movie trenches, primarily at Republic Pictures. Mann said that when he got a script, he would immediately look through it to find the scenes that were attention-getting set pieces, 
the ones where he could really show off his chops as a director. He would put all of his energy, as well as the studio's time and money, into crafting these scenes because they were the ones that were going to get him noticed and advance his career. He knew executives at major studios didn't watch entire films. They just wanted to see samples of a director's strongest, most imaginative work. So Mann would go all out on those scenes, maybe three or four in each picture. Think of films like Railroaded and Desperate. And then he'd finish up all the stuff he considered passage work as simply and efficiently as possible. And I really think the same is true of the way Joseph Lewis, another veteran of the B-movie trenches, approached the making of this film. And I do want to point out, and this is no slight to Joe Lewis, that it was Phil Jordan, who the more I think about it probably did write this screenplay, that came up with the hearing aid gimmick. And it's clearly the work of the writer, since the hearing aid defines McClure's character and it's utilized in different ways throughout the movie. And if you have any doubt about Jordan's influence on this film's perverse streak, check out another movie he wrote called The Chase from 1946, which features this same kind of weird cruelty played out by sadistic sidekicks Steve Cochran and Peter Lorre. In The Chase, Cochran plays a Miami gangster named Eddie Roman, who might as well be the twin brother of Mr. Brown. They are virtually the same character. Look at that drunken cop. Isn't that a shame? Scenes like this one, where the bad guys drop the deputy on the sheriff's doorstep, always remind me of how cops and robbers' stories are all pretty much the same regardless of the period in which they're set. This script could easily be adapted as a Western, and I can see him tossing Diamond out of the back of a buckboard in front of the town jail. It makes me wonder if the inspiration for this film wasn't The Big Heat, which was a huge hit for Columbia a couple of years earlier, and is another modern-dress cops and robbers saga that, at heart, plays exactly like a Western. Well, Bob Middleton gets all the heavy lifting in this scene, given the thankless task of pacing around, espousing a bunch of crucial expository information. I'd like to start by picking up Brown and company. No, you can't. They outsmarted you. Take a look in the mirror. There's not a mark on you. You were drunk. You came here on your own. That's the defense. And it's airtight, Leonard. That's why Brown delivered you here. Now, to me, this is the test of a good character actor. Expressing emotion is easy for actors. But give a guy a page of script that's nothing but plot explication and tell them to make it realistic and believable? That's acting. Check out Jeff Corey's deathbed scene in The Killers, where he expires while explaining the whole plot of the movie. And it's actually compelling. So Bob Middleton earned his paycheck with this scene, which I probably don't even need to add at this point is enacted in one take before a single camera setup, greatly enhanced by John Alton's moody but practical lighting scheme. And I hate to tell the lieutenant this, but sponging his ear with hot water will not stop the ringing in his head. I'm not sure where he got this advice. Rita probably could have helped him out with this, but uh, Captain Peterson here is no help at all. Now, here's another iconic image from Los Angeles Noir, an L.A. gas company tank. This is the one at Santa Monica Boulevard and Formosa Street, which you can see in films like T-Men and Cry Danger, among many others. This one was only a few blocks from Kling Studios, where the bulk of this film was shot. Of course, this scene has to start tight on some spaghetti, since that's the lone clue that has led Diamond to this guy. Remember Conti blurting out Bettini in response to spaghetti during, during his polygraph. 
And how about two seconds after that last scene ends, Diamond just walks right into this guy's hideout, where he's been hiding for the last seven years to avoid Brown's killers. I mean, how in the hell did he just find this guy out of the blue? I'm putting aside my quibbles with the logic that brought us to this scene, we do get to see in action one of my favorite film noir character actors. They shot some white paint into his hair to try to make Ted DeCorsia look older than his 50 years, and for once he's playing a character who's tired and frail, since his specialty was typically burly, intimidating greaseballs. DeCorsia had a fantastic gravelly voice, which was used to great effect on the radio before Orson Welles capitalized on his visual potential, casting him as the sleazy and ill-fated Sidney Broom in Lady from Shanghai, which was DeCorsia's first film. There is no doubt this scene was filmed as a single shot, essentially a little six-minute, one-act play, and I'm sure DeCorsia appreciated the chance to do it as a single take. But in post-production, somebody probably Cornell Wilde, got the idea that the scene should be enhanced by cutting in a couple of close-ups of Lieutenant Diamond. And these would have worked better if there was even the slightest attention paid to making sure they matched the master shot. As it is, there is a significant difference in the lighting between the full shot and those inserts. According to some trade paper reports, the producers went back to shoot additional footage almost a month and a half after shooting had wrapped. And I'm wondering if the close-ups of Wilde weren't pickups specifically intended to break up Lewis's reliance on single-take master shots. Take your time, Mr. Bettini. It was on Grazzi's boat, three days out for Portugal. He looked like a guy who'd spent his entire life in boxing gyms and bookie joints. But that was certainly not his lot in life. He'd been an actor since childhood, having started in vaudeville. But in 1948, when Jules Dassin cast him as the thuggish Willie Garza in The Naked City, de Corsi's screen persona was pretty much set in stone. Aside from playing a judge in A Place in the Sun, I don't think I've ever seen him play anything other than a menacing heavy. Well, except for this picture, where he's a one-time menacing heavy gone to seed. What happened to him? How do you know? I know Brown. I know Brown, too. That's no evidence. Then there was the ship's anchor. What about it? We stopped at the SOS. The skipper went ashore and got another one. Do you think she was murdered and tied to the ship's anchor and dropped into the sea? I don't know which came first. I jumped ship at the moment we landed. In addition to Lady from Shanghai and Naked City, de Corsia is especially memorable in a quartet of terrific noir films. The Enforcer from 1951, which might be his best performance, certainly is sweatiest. Coincidentally, in that film, he plays, in a very different manner, essentially the same guy he is here, a scared gangster being strong-armed into testifying against his former boss. So this wasn't a big casting stretch. De Corsi is also fantastic in Crime Wave as bank-robbing mastermind Doc Penny, and he plays a big-shot gangster in Slightly Scarlet, also photographed by John Alton, a picture in which he gets a tremendous death scene. I'll say no more about that. Just watch it. Maybe best of all is, of course, Stanley Kubrick's The Killing, where he plays corrupt cop Randy Kennan, one of the crucial links in that brilliantly staged racetrack robbery. I got them all on. Check this. How come a nice guy like you is a cop? Just lucky, I guess. 
If Ted DeCourcy saw the big combo after it was released, I'll bet you anything he was righteously pissed that they stuck those two shots of Cornell Wilde into this scene, breaking up what had been all of a piece. Especially given that the next scene is staged exactly the same way for another veteran noir character actor. And it, too, almost remains intact as a single shot, except for the insertion of another completely unnecessary close-up. Yes, my love, that is what I've been telling you for the last five minutes, but you don't listen. The script now starts to feel less like cops and robbers and more like a detective story, as Diamond picks up DeGrazzi's trail and encounters a series of eccentric characters all connected to the fateful voyage at the core of the plot. And we go from one familiar noir face to another, this being actor John Hoyt, whom hardcore noir aficionados will recognize from pictures such as Brute Force, To the Ends of the Earth, The Bribe, Outside the Wall, as well as literally hundreds of television shows all the way through the 1980s. Uh, this purchase was made in 1946. 1946? I'm sorry I was not in business then. Unlike Ted DeCorsia, Hoyt was not born into this business. Although they were both New Yorkers, Hoyt studied at Yale and was quite the intellectual. His first career, in fact, was as a history teacher at the exclusive Groton Prep School in Connecticut, where the children of famed alumni Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt were among his students. But after a fashion, he no longer felt education was sufficiently challenging so he started performing in summer stock plays on Long Island, which eventually led him to Broadway in the early 1930s. He was even versatile enough to appear in the Ziegfeld Follies, where he performed with Bob Hope and Fanny Bryce. And for a while, he even had his own cabaret show. But once he made his movie debut in 1945's OSS, he became pretty much typecast, playing parts like this one. Erudite, superior, somewhat condescending, even without the faux German accent. I guess Hoyt typically came across as a particularly intimidating history teacher. My name is Niels Dreyer. I live at 821 Mason Avenue. That is all I have to tell you. You know, Mr. Dreyer, things changed since I walked in here. Brown knows I'm here. He knows I'm talking to you. I said nothing. Yeah, but Brown doesn't know that. My favorite John Hoyt performance is in a hard-to-find 1956 movie called The Come On, another Allied artist picture, where he plays an itinerant confidence man working with femme fatale Ann Baxter, who tries to pull off a scam on sucker Sterling Hayden. I really wish this movie could make a comeback on DVD, because it is great fun. Hoyt really gets to sink his teeth into a slimy, villainous role, and he is absolutely great at it. I want to take a moment here to make it clear that although I'm pointing out how virtually every scene is staged in a single shot, I'm not suggesting there's anything inherently wrong with that. I've never read an interview with Joseph Lewis where he discussed shooting this picture, but it's obvious to me that he was coping with a super short schedule and needed to be incredibly efficient which, of course, meant working with reliable actors like DeCourcy and Hoyt, guys who had no problem knocking out a few pages of dialogue in one take. But I wonder if Lewis wasn't challenging himself, and maybe John Alton as well, to see how few setups it would take to get this whole picture in the can. In terms of direction, this scene might be my favorite in the movie so far. And I suspect John Alton probably had a lot to do with its staging. Hello? Hello? It must have killed both the director and the DP to have the producers later insert a needless close-up into this fantastic shot, showing Hoyt pulling his gun from the drawer. I guess it didn't read well in the master shot, although... What the hell else would it be? He forgot a pack of cigarettes? I I don't don't know. I think Lewis turned in a much more elegant film, and the producers messed with it by injecting a bunch of awkward and obvious close-ups in a 
misguided attempt to clarify things. This scene in Brown's hideout begins like it's going to be another in the series of single-shot scenes, and it may have been done all the way through in a single master shot, but Lewis wisely broke down the confrontation between Brown and McClure into a series of reverse angles to heighten the tension between the two men, which is essential to building up McClure's inevitable and understandable betrayal of Brown. Sorry, Mr. Brown. Something actor Turhan Bey told me once explained a lot about John Alton's talent and why he liked working as a freelancer on low-budget pictures rather than being under contract to a studio. Turhan worked with Alton on a picture for Eagle Lion called The Spiritualist, and he remembered Jack, as everybody called him, completely dominating the production, even though Alton's friend and colleague, Bernard Voorhaus, was the nominal director. Every morning, by the time the cast and crew showed up, Alton would already have all the lighting schemes arranged, ready to go. He'd give the director the sequencing of the camera setups, which corresponded to the way he'd arrange the lights around the set. That way, no time was spent rearranging lights between takes. They just move the camera into a new position, and voila! Alton would flip a switch, and the preset lighting would pop on for the next setup. In this way, Alton was also dictating a lot of the blocking because he'd tell the actors exactly where to move to fit into his lighting scheme. According to Turhan Bay, it was an amazing thing to witness. They'd get twice as many shots done in a day as they would with a quote-unquote normal cameraman. This explains why Alton commanded top dollar on low-budget productions, because he ensured that everything was done efficiently that the low budget would be hidden in his shadows, and that no money was wasted in idle time. And, of course, the finished picture looked more interesting and evocative than the work of most other DPs. I know this picture was shot quickly and efficiently because there was reportedly a rough cut ready to be scored by David Raxon as early as the first week in October, which means production lasted only a few weeks. But an item in Variety dated November 9th, 1954, indicated that the producers were going back to film more scenes with Cornell Wilde, who by that time had already moved on to another production at Fox, The Scarlet Coat. My hunch is that some of this extra footage consisted of those close-ups they used to break up a lot of the single-shot scenes, and perhaps some of it was an attempt to bring more life to Wilde's performance because in static medium shots of the two actors, Wilde consistently gets blown off the screen by Conti. It's interesting that this simple little scene in the bank vault, which is only about 30 seconds long, is comprised of more separate shots than either scene with Ted DeCorsia or John Hoyt, at least the way Lewis intended those scenes to play without the cut-ins. The driver was a very meticulous man. He kept a complete record of everything in his shop. Now we come to round three in the knockdown drag out bout between Lieutenant Diamond and Mr. Brown, which will again be won decisively by the smarmy heel, who's always one step ahead of this beleaguered flatfoot. This is a terrific scene, with Jordan giving Brown all the choice dialogue and Lewis composing it almost exactly as he did the initial meeting of Brown and Diamond in the hospital with Conti insociently commanding the foreground while Wilde stands sort of haplessly behind him. And like that previous scene, it's blocked so that Brown barely even looks at Diamond, as if he can't be bothered to address this loser directly. And of course, Conti is terrific. He seems to be having a ball with this role. He carries this film, in my opinion. And you can see why 17 years later, he was the leading candidate for the role of Vito Corleone until they gave Marlon Brando an offer he couldn't refuse to make The Godfather. You will recall that Conti ended up playing Don Corleone's rival, Barzini. And here, like the previous scene between Conti and Don Levy, Lewis breaks up the single take with an emphatic close-up of Wilde. It's brief, but it's the best shot of him so far in the film. And a gun under your arm. With a big yen for a girl you can't have. 
First is first, and second is nobody. Yeah, uh, the DA is out. I have his assistant. Here we get another example of John Alton's value to a production. Now, the script called for a scene in a concert hall, but obviously the producers had no intention of renting one, even if they could afford it. Instead, they construct a rudimentary balcony on a raised platform, drape the entire set in black velvet to absorb the light, stick a grand piano in the foreground, and have Jacob Gimple work the ivories. Jacob Gimple was one of the go-to guys in Hollywood for piano solos, which he provided for probably a couple of dozen movies, mostly in the 1950s. There's something odd about the way Lewis directs this simple scene between Wallace and Wilde. Instead of composing it as a simple two-shot, he breaks entirely with what he's been doing up to this point and constructs the scene as a series of oddly disconnected close-ups, which really heightens the distance between the two characters, who literally are only inches apart. It's kind of awkwardly disjointed, but it's also effective in expressing the weird dynamic between these two characters. Now, I want to take a moment to mention one of the more intriguing films on Gene Wallace's resume. In 1950, she was cast by director Pierre Chanel to star in the film adaptation of Richard Wright's landmark novel, Native Son. The story was too controversial to be made in the United States, so Buenos Aires substituted for Chicago, and after actor Canada Lee had to drop out, Wright ended up playing the role of Bigger Thomas himself. A lot of Hollywood actresses were considered for the role of Mary Dalton, the rich dilettante Bigger accidentally kills, but frankly none of them had the guts that Wallace displayed by agreeing to participate in a production so controversial for its racial and political commentary. I'm sure at the time Wallace's miserable personal life was a factor in her deciding to escape to Argentina for a while, but whatever the case, her performance in Native Son is one of the best I've ever seen from her. She's bright, lively, and focused. Yet, sadly, not long after she returned from Argentina, she attempted suicide a second time. There's a lot of mystery surrounding her life at that point, but there is no mystery after she hooked up with Cornell Wilde. She never made another picture in which he wasn't the star. Now, before this, in 1954, they made Star of India together, and after the big combo, they'd co-star in Storm Fear, The Devil's Hairpin, uh, Maracaibo, The Sword of Lancelot, Beach Red, and No Blade of Grass. All of these made, in all or part, by Wilde's Theodora Productions. Now, there were a lot of years between those last three films, and Wallace never made another picture after 1970. She divorced Wilde in 1980 and lived the last 10 years of her life in Doris Day, Tippi Hedren style, preferring the company of animals to that of men. This scene in the hidden vault, one of the best in the picture, and another one in which Alton's handiwork is in evidence. It's only 10.30. Is the concert that dull? Take your hands off me. Okay. This is also a crucial scene because it's the first time we see Mr. Brown show any kind of vulnerability which goes a long way towards humanizing this venal and despicable character. We don't know at this point that he's lying to Susan about his wife, but Conti plays it so well that regardless of whether this proves to be the truth or just a cover story, he manages to make the character sympathetic. We don't take checks. We deal strictly in cash. There isn't anybody I would trust with so much temptation except myself. Again, the entire scene is staged as a single continuous shot, except for one odd but very effective cut when Conti grabs Wallace and spins her around. The camera jumps in a few feet on the cut, and then Lewis gradually pulls back to resume the position the camera was in originally. It's so quick it's almost subliminal. 
but it's one of the most effective bits of editing in the film. The machine gave me a strange present. Why was it a pair of handcuffs? I want to meet her. I want to meet your wife, Mr. Brown. You can't. Why? Because she's dead? No, she's alive. She's living in Sicily in Grazzi's house. And again, I will point out how much this feels like a Western. By the mid-1950s, on-screen crime exposés were obsessed with showing how the mob worked like a well-oiled corporate organization. The top guys presented like CEOs who never got their hands dirty in actual vice operations. Now, by contrast, here we have a guy literally counting his money himself with an old-school Tommy gun displayed amidst this arsenal. I'm surprised you didn't have a couple of horses tied up in there and some branding irons to use on the stolen cattle. The combination that's supposed to be some citywide syndicate really feels like a small band of outlaws robbing stagecoaches. This short scene with Helene Stanton, another single shot lasting about 25 seconds, doesn't seem like much, but it's actually a bit racy for its time. A desk clerk handing over to a stripper the keys to a cop's apartment is precisely the kind of thing the production code office would have flagged 10 years earlier. Say goodbye to Miss Stanton. This sadly is the last we'll be seeing of lovely Rita. Lee Van Cleef is way more handsome in this film than he was in other similar roles like Kansas City Confidential, where director Phil Carlson made him look as grotesque as his bad guy cronies, Neville Brand and Jack Elam. Alton's lighting brings out both the strength and the refinement in his features. And here's where we get the first clue that something's up with our buddy-buddy button men. These guys are a little closer than your average movie hitmen, whom I don't suppose make a habit of bunking together. Although, what do I really know about the personal lives of hired killers? Earl Holloman told me that he and Lee Van Cleef had decided to play this scene with one of them wearing the top and the other the bottom of the same pair of pajamas, and that they were disappointed when Joe Lewis framed it so closely that you really couldn't tell what they were wearing. There's barely a breath between Brown ordering Diamond's execution and Fante and Mingo carrying out the contract, which, of course, they're going to screw up. This is another scene I consider one of the film's greatest hits, no pun intended, because for me it calls up Charles McGraw and William Conrad, the classic hitmen from The Killers. You'll recall that in that film all we saw was Burt Lancaster's hand dangling after he'd been shot, which Lewis imitates. Lewis shoots this scene in the residence hotel exactly like he did the earlier scene in the burlesque house. A single shot in the hallway outside, cut to the interior, and another single shot within the apartment. I am sure that if he could have gotten the camera to pass around the wall, he probably would have done it and kept this as one single shot. This is the scene where Diamond realizes he's sacrificed his humanity and his obsession to bring down Brown. But I have to say, I have a hard time buying Cornell Wilde's performance. Maybe he was stretched a little thin by also having the responsibility of producing the film. But I have seen him give much better performances in other movies. Although he musters effectively teary eyes at the end of this scene, his line readings are pretty lame. And honestly, he is not helped by Jordan's dialogue, all of which rings kind of false. The better performance in this scene is by Jay Adler. And if you're not familiar with him, he is part of the Adler acting dynasty, which included his brother Luther, a prominent Broadway stage actor before enjoying a successful Hollywood career, and of course his sister Stella, who will always be remembered first and foremost as Marlon Brando's acting teacher. I'm just going to say for the record that Jay is my favorite Adler. He's underused in this picture, but if you see him in stuff like Cry Danger and 99 River Street, you know what a scene stealer this guy can be. Now, I don't recall anybody using this character's full name in the movie, but in the script, Jordan calls him Sam Hill, which is a joke because the expression, what in Sam Hill, was common American slang for what the hell's going on. 
I could tell you several possible origins of that expression, but we've only got about mm, 18 minutes left to go. I'm trying to figure out what finally prompts Susan to turn against Brown and come forward with info about Alicia and the crucial photograph. Is it just sisterhood? It wasn't like Jordan gave her an epiphany. She just decides one fine day to get herself straight. I'm not going to say that it's unbelievable, but I am going to say that it's not dramatically satisfying. What does he keep in the vault? Guns and money. I'd like to imagine Brown keeps some lawyers in that vault, too, in addition to the guns and money. Warren Zevon, you live on. That she was murdered? No. I can prove that she's alive. What are you talking about? She's living in Sicily with Grazzi. That's impossible. She sent this to Brown. It's Alicia, all right. Years older than her photograph taken on the boat. And she must be alive. But this photo was never taken in Sicily. There's snow on the ground. Watching this scene of incredible forensic police work, I have to question any use of the word intelligence, despite the way Lieutenant Diamond keeps tossing it around, especially since it has required so much sloppy work by various law enforcement agencies all along the way to make this backstory even remotely plausible. Seriously, don't think too hard about this plot making any sense. I can't quite accept this notion that Mr. Brown would keep photographic mementos of Alicia, considering that it would obviously disprove his ruse about her being in Sicily. I guess the crook in this film is just as inept as the cops. What about Bettini's story? Uh, Bettini was right about a murder taking place on the boat. He was just wrong about the identity of the victim. Okay, I was just looking up Robert Middleton's credits and was surprised to see that this was only his second feature. He'd already had a long career in radio, which makes sense, considering he'd studied in a music conservatory and had a good singing voice. But later this same year, he'd co-star with Humphrey Bogart and Frederick March in William Wyler's The Desperate Hours, where he played a sadistic killer in Bogart's gang. And that was the role that kind of typecast him for the rest of his career in which he'd play more than his share of homicidal hillbillies and leaders of lynch mobs. This brief passage here might be the most shocking thing in the film so far. An actual exterior, shot on location in broad daylight. The first of its kind in the film, and in fact, the only one. And it, of course, leads directly into a scene filmed on a soundstage in... Yes, you guessed it, another single take, staged as a simple two-shot. This was the first time actress Helen Walker had been on screen in more than two years, and I think it was very courageous and compassionate of the producers to cast her in this role. Walker had serious problems with alcohol most of her adult life. She was only 35 years old when she made this picture, and frankly, she looks older. The booze was starting to fray her seams. To be honest, I really don't think she would have been cast in this film were it not for the support of the main actors. She and Cornell Wilde were stablemates at 20th Century Fox in the 1940s, and one of the first films she made was a horse racing picture called Home Stretch, in which she co-starred with Wilde. Right after that, she made Call Northside 777, in which Richard Conti had one of his rare sympathetic roles. The following year, 1949, she gave a fantastic performance as the wicked wife of Brian Donlevy in a trim little noir called Impact. So she'd previously worked with all her big combo co-stars, and I can't help but think that that had everything to do with her being cast. It's really amazing to consider the start Walker had in Hollywood where she arrived in 1942 at only 22 years of age. Through a stroke of good fortune, she got a job as Dorothy McGuire's understudy in the Broadway production Claudia, although she never actually got a chance to appear in it. But writer Samson Rafelson took a shine to her and gave her a featured role in his stage play, Jason, which earned her great notices 
an interest from Paramount. And she was only in that show for four months before she quit and headed to Hollywood to sign a studio contract. The sky seemed the limit, at least until Walker, who had a reputation as a free-spirited, fun-loving gal, gave a ride to some hitchhikers on the way back to Los Angeles from Palm Springs on New Year's Eve 1946. Something happened and she lost control of the car, and in the ensuing crash, one of the passengers, Private First Class Robert E. Lee, was killed. Walker faced manslaughter charges, which were eventually dismissed. And then one of the hitchhikers later brought a civil suit against her. And even though she was eventually exonerated of all charges, the whole thing cast a pall over her meteoric rise. And according to many sources, and this is what led to her alcoholism. This might as well be John Alton signing this film, as this is a trademark Alton scene, all the action revolving around great lighting effects emanating from practical sources, in this case, a simple table lamp. This is precisely what I meant about Alton, in essence, directing scenes based on his lighting. The way this scene is lit dictates where the actors move to hit their marks. And just for good measure, Alton ups the noir quotient by throwing in some Venetian blind shadows in the background. And if you're keeping score, there are two camera setups in this scene. I'm going to keep bringing this up because I've done well over 30 audio commentaries, but I have never done one for a film that has so few shots. I'm tempted to go back and count them all up. I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't more minutes in this film than there are camera setups, which is almost unheard of. I'm going to leave it to some enterprising aficionado to determine if I'm talking out my hat or if I am actually close to being on target. Earlier in the film, Alton conjured a concert hall out of nothing, and now, using even less, he creates a general aviation airport, which will be crucial to two big scenes in the last act. When Peter Bogdanovich interviewed Joe Lewis, the director gave a lot of credit to Alton, not just for his visual sense, but for his ability to save the company so much time and money. They were actually planning to go out to Santa Monica or Long Beach or someplace to shoot at an actual airport, but Alton told them to skip it. He could do it on the soundstage using nothing but black velvet, a fog machine, and a single rotating light to simulate the control tower. That's it. There is virtually nothing else in this scene to even remotely suggest an airport. Now, I'm not sure what this contraption is in the background by the corrugated tin wall, but I want to think this was a little in-joke pertaining to the director's nickname, Wagon Wheel Joe. He got that moniker when he was shooting low-budget westerns in the 1940s because his fallback for any boring composition was to stick a wagon wheel in front of the camera to make the image more interesting, to give it more depth. McClure's murder is one of the scenes in this film always cited as evidence of Lewis's creativity. But I have to play devil's advocate here and suggest this was in the script all along. It's almost as if this scene is the reason McClure wears a hearing aid in the first place. Just for this stylistic flourish when Mr. Brown pulls it out as a weirdly merciful gesture before having the guy machine gunned to death. If I'm wrong about that, I apologize, Joe. But when I was researching my book, Gun Crazy, The Origin of American Outlaw Cinema, I read every interview I could find with Joe Lewis. And like virtually every director, he claimed to have invented all the most memorable moments in his films. Now, that's understandable with Gun Crazy, since it was clearly the best film he ever made and the one he was most proud of. But after digging up five drafts of that screenplay, written either by McKinley Cantor or Dalton Trumbo, before Lewis ever came on the project, I can attest that a lot of the stuff Lewis took credit for is explicitly stated in the screenplay. He did a tremendous job realizing those ideas, but he did not come up with those ideas himself. One of the great disservices of the auteur theory is that it's led to virtually everything being credited to the director. 
I mean, cinephiles refer to this as Joseph H. Lewis's The Big Combo, even though it clearly reads on the main title, The Big Combo by Philip Jordan. And as I have pointed out repeatedly, John Alton has as much, if not more, creative input on the style of this film than did Joe Lewis. I'd even argue that Cornell Wilde, making his first film as a producer, had as much influence on the finished film, for better or worse, than did Joe Lewis. And I would assert that next to Alton, the most valuable contributor to this movie is Richard Conti, who is largely responsible for embodying the cruel energy that gives the big combo its snap, crackle, and pop. This is a nicely conceived scene in Diamond's office, as the gangster's wife and his girlfriend are finally brought face to face. Lewis stages it to enhance the physical similarities between the two women, and we get some poignancy when they realize how much they have in common. Of course, the point is belabored by having Diamond throw this observation right in the women's faces and the audiences. You saw him do it, didn't you? I never said I did. I don't know about you, but I'm getting really tired of Diamond's one-note hectoring style. Of course, this is part of the yin-yang subversion that Jordan intended. The virtuous guy callously browbeats women while the corrupt villain sweet talks and sexually satisfies them. Helen Walker had a tough line to walk with this performance, playing a woman who is pretending to be insane in order to escape the miserable reality of her life. She's so goofy and unbelievable at times that I had to keep reminding myself, oh yeah, this is a woman playing a woman who is play-acting badly. I can only imagine the conversations that Helen Walker and Jean Wallace must have had in their dressing room. Both these women had led lives filled with rougher stuff than anything they're asked to portray in this film. The conclusion of this scene, with Mr. Brown appearing in the station house to slyly intimidate Alicia, plays exactly like a 1950s TV show. I expect a commercial to suddenly appear after the fade-out. In some ways, Joe Lewis may have been instinctively preparing himself for the next stage of his career, which would be in television. In the two years following this film, he'd make four more low-budget movies, including his final feature, The Terrific Terror in a Texas Town, before finishing his career directing eight years of episodic television on shows like Gunsmoke, The Rifleman, and The Big Valley. Okay, we're about six scenes from the end of this movie, and things are really starting to move fast. Almost too fast. My hunch is that there were scenes cut out of this film, which may be why it feels sort of ramshackle in its final stage. I know that both Philip Van Zandt and Whit Bissell, familiar character actors, were on the original cast list for this film, but they appear nowhere in it. You're going to notice that the next few scenes all end with a character walk-on included solely for the purpose of advancing the plot. In fact, delivering lines like this is the entire reason that Jay Adler's character is in this film. To walk on at the end of a scene and tell Lieutenant Diamond what's just happened in a scene that they didn't have the budget to shoot. Okay, now we get to one of my favorite moments in the film. The relationship between Fanti and Mingo becomes a little more obvious in this scene. I once had Earl Holloman as a guest at one of my film festivals, not for this movie, but for another one he did the same year. I died a thousand times. And at one point we got around to discussing the big combo and how unusual it was for the era to have gay crooks in a film. He was a little taken aback when I pointed this out. You saw that? He kept asking. Not because it wasn't in there, of course, but because the filmmakers never imagined that the public would catch it. It was just an inside joke they stuck in the film. Of course, this scene couldn't be much more blatant, at least to a modern audience, in depicting these guys as queer. My favorite bit? Holloman grumbling that he can't swallow no more salami. Then there's his desperate clutching of Fanti's arm when he says, let's go away together. And Van Cleef's crack about how the cops will be looking for us in every closet. 
But this stuff is actually nothing compared to the gay stuff in Lewis's previous film, Cry of the Hunted, which isn't nearly as well known. Check that film out if you want to see some outrageously suggestive homosexual subtext between Barry Sullivan and Vittorio Gossman. That one's even got male mud wrestling and a homoerotic dream sequence featuring fire-spouting phallic symbols. Clearly, some graduate student needs to write a thesis on homosexual undercurrents in the cinema of Joseph H. Lewis. At the risk of having Phil Jordan come back from the dead and hunt me down, I have to nitpick the way he chose to dispose of Fanti and Mingo. It's been established that they are in an underground hideout in a building owned by Mr. Brown, so why would Mr. Brown use explosives to get rid of these guys, potentially ruining his investment, instead of just shooting them both when he had the drop on them? I get that Mr. Brown never likes to do the dirty work himself, but really? A bomb? Here comes the waiter, walking on to provide the next bit of exposition required to move the story ahead. You always know the gangster in a movie because no matter what expensive meal they order, they must eat it in the most arrogant and uncouth manner. Diamond had earlier been outraged by Mr. Brown eating bacon and eggs after ordering a killing. I can only imagine how he'd feel if he saw Brown devouring lobster and a second bottle of wine. Our hangdog pal, poor Sam Hill, meets an ignominious end here. I'm assuming from the way this scene is staged, with no dramatic reveal of Mr. Brown as the lift doors open, that Richard Conti was not available to shoot this scene. I suspect this is a stand-in lunging into the lift and grabbing Gene Wallace. Given that we've now seen that Mr. Brown is capable of gunning someone down, I ask again, why didn't he just get rid of Fanti and Mingo that way? As fast as the action is heading towards a finale, the response of medical professionals in this film is alarmingly slow. Now, the waiter told Mr. Brown a while ago that Mingo was still alive. In the interim, Mr. Brown has had enough time to kill Sam Hill and kidnap Susan Lowell. And yet here we find Mingo still alive, who knows how many hours later, and still lying amid the smoking rubble of a secret hideout the police had no trouble finding. Actors love nothing more than a dramatic deathbed scene, and Earl Holloman makes the most of this one. It's remarkable that the script spells out his love for his dead buddy, Fanti, using it as the leverage that gets him to finally finger Mr. Brown. Unless anyone think we're imagining all this gay stuff. Come on, you can't get any more explicit than this. What's interesting is even the cop knows these guys were gay. Earl Holloman is around 88 years old now, and he was working in movies and TV up until about 17 years ago. In America, he's most well-known for having played Angie Dickinson's partner in the 1970s series Police Woman. And he's always been a very well-liked guy in Hollywood, one of those old-school conservative guys who never let it be known that he was gay. I say, don't worry about it so much, Earl. Not a big deal. I realize that several minutes have passed since I last pointed out that virtually every scene in the third act is staged in a single shot. And this one of Helen Walker in her hospital bed is no exception. Sadly, this scene would end up being Helen Walker's Hollywood swan song. She never made another picture after the big combo. She did one local theater production and a tiny amount of television in the late 50s, but for all intents and purposes, she vanished by the dawn of the 1960s. And when she died in 1968, the cause of death was announced as cancer, but by all accounts, she would have drunk herself to death anyway. There are innumerable tragic stories like this in Hollywood, but something about Helen Walker strikes me as especially sad. I hope people realize that my critical observations about this film aren't meant to be a knock on Joe Lewis as a director. This was a job. He took it on short notice, and he did the best he could with it, given the obvious budgetary constraints. I just have a vested interest in trying to counterbalance a lot of sycophantic scholarship that for decades has swirled around the auteur theory. According to some of this stuff, 
Joe Lewis was a great unheralded artistic genius. Well, to me, he was a better than average director who rarely got scripts good enough to show off what he was really capable of. He quit the business because his wife was afraid he was going to have a heart attack, which I take to mean he felt his talent was misused and that he was superior to the material he was paid to direct. So he decided to get out before his heart exploded. Well, we've reached the final scene, a return to John Alton's makeshift airport. It's easy to imagine what this scene was like in the original script, and I will bet you dollars to donuts it included an idling airplane waiting to whisk the villain and his captive away from the cops that are closing in. I mean, the airport getaway was a pretty common trope, right? Instead, Conti is given a line complaining about the pilot not showing up on time, which explains why there is no airplane in a scene that clearly calls for one. But none of this is really a problem, because the scene provides John Alton with another signature moment in which the victim, Susan Lowell, gets to turn the tables on Mr. Brown by literally using single source lighting, a John Alton specialty, as the weapon that brings him down. Now, I like to imagine that this was actually Alton's idea. I'm not sure this scene makes a lot of sense. I mean, what self-respecting crime boss walks into a location from which there's no escape route? But there is emotional resonance to the way Susan wields the spotlight, tracking Brown like he's vermin climbed out from under a rock, suddenly exposed and vulnerable. It is a symbolically satisfying gimmick. So, I won't ask why Brown doesn't just shoot out the light and put himself and Diamond both in the dark. But, hey, the movie has to end at some point, and this is it. Kill me! Let's Kill me. go, Oodlum. And it's too late to do him any good now, but if John Alton had a buck for every time someone reprinted this final shot in their treatise on film noir, he could have died a rich man. So I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on this oddball crime film and come away appreciating why I never use the term a film by. Because then I'd have to say a film by Philip Jordan, Cornell Wilde, John Alton, and Joseph H. Lewis. And that would never fit on a single title card. This is Eddie Muller signing off, hoping that we all live long enough to die in bed.